What's up, Barefoot Nation? This week, I am doing a project showcase on that beautiful ecosystem pond that I built four years ago. 2019, uh, four years, it was built in May. I can't wait to get into it. Let's go. So this is an aquascape ecosystem pond. So basically what this pond is, is this is meant to be, it's technically a water garden, but um, this is, I'm gonna go out there and say it, maybe not these water depths, but this is the best habitat for koi. All right, let the dumpster fire in the comments go. All right, I, there's no that. So anyways, guys, the aquascape ecosystem has a whole bunch of components to it. Rock and gravel on the inside of the pond and the entirety of the pond. So that's the first thing. Uh, the next component is fish. Another component is plants. And then the last two components are the kind of... Logie is just in the way. Like, dude, I love you, but you're in the way. And so the last component, fourth component to the aquascape ecosystem is mechanical filtration. This is your skimmer filter, which has a basket and also a pad, which that needs to be cleaned, holy cow. Quick aside, look at how beat up and like, just cool this bark is on this tree. It's probably because there's been up to like five children climbing around chasing each other in this canopy over the years. And so the last component to the aquascape ecosystem, which ties in with rock and gravel, is biological filtration. This here, what you're looking at, is the filter. This is, so this is a biofalls. And basically what this is, is that sack of mud, basically is a bag of lava rock. You can also use the synthetic bio balls. Personally, I like to stick with the lava rock. Um, also weighs the bag down a little bit better. But um, that has, tons like billions of different forms of nitrifying beneficial bacteria and there's also two two uh coarse filter mats in there and that's going to basically polish your water so the water is going to originate here through pvc flex pvc pipe usually two inch lines that are buried in this garden so when i built this waterfall all this moss that you see here is planted and it has spread a ton since I've built it. Basically, um, what I would do is I would take the waterfall foam and stick that to the stones and then all of this spread that you see has happened since 2019. And that's with, you can see especially on this rock, that it's real patchy. That's because birds will come in and spring and pick large sections of moss off for their nests. So you would think that would really decimate the moss population, but it's thriving and the, it just makes it look even more natural. By the way, I'm literally in the pond right now. Um, this shelf depth is just, even the deepest section is just perfect for waiting. Um, not particularly hot today, but it still feels good. So the ferns, these here are sensitive ferns, and these plants actually were volunteers on this property. So before I uh, had my redbud area and that bed around the redbud, that was lawn, and these for whatever reason decided to volunteer in the lawn, and I had them planted in my last water feature to propagate them, and now they've basically formed kind of a nice little mass planting, very nice. These are deciduous. Um, after about six years, my liriope shark fin is finally starting to kind of come to um, fruition and they're all kind of grown together into a nice um, sea of grass, so to speak. Um, you can see that they're starting to send up their flower stalks. And uh, the liriope is evergreen, but what's lovely about this plant is for one, they love, or they're very tolerant of dry shade, which is a tough area to have a garden in. Um, underneath this ash tree, which is about a 20 year old tree, amazingly, it is treated for the emerald ash borer. Um, it's pretty dry shade, so, and there is absolutely no supplemental irrigation. The only little trick 
that I've done again with the pond is the underlayment fabric, you can actually wrap that over in certain areas and that'll keep the soil a little bit more moist, kind of around a nice little band. But anyway, again, I can talk about the pond for an extended, I can do a whole series on ponds. Um, and so this liriope was, I want to say, um, the variety is Big Blue. But what I was saying earlier before I went on my little tangent is that the wind will, the slightest little breeze will make this whole thing just move and it's just lovely. Absolutely gorgeous plants to have and they don't, and the, they only really need to be cut back after a really tough winter. So I cut these back two years ago because it was a particularly, um, not particularly cold, but there wasn't any snow cover. Here in Western New York, we get a ton of, uh, well, we get a fair amount of snow. Over here is a patch of ostrich ferns, which this was one plant that started now I gotta get out of the water. So this whole patch of ferns that you see here was one one gallon plant that was planted back in like 2015 or so. And it has spread that much in that period of time. Again, they're short because of the lack of moisture. Ostrich ferns really do like a moist environment, so that's really holding them back the lack of moisture. You can see just an area with different types of sedge, two Carex Ice Dance, and Everest, um, coral bells, my dad's been into coral bells lately. And this skip laurel was planted back in 2020. Um, it was a three foot tall B&B plant and now it's about six and a half feet tall. Um, kind of at the tallest point you see here, kind of, sort of. Kind of the tallest point you see here and it's about five feet tall that way what i love about the skip laurel um once they've been in the ground for a few years is they kind of widen out when you plant them they're oftentimes pretty columnar and now it's definitely starting to fill out and the leaves are bigger too um, but these laurels down below negative five will completely turn brown and look entirely bleh and look entirely dead. And looking at the laurel from this angle, well, the sun's also going in that way too, but you can see the kind of lopsided growth is because there, were, there was a whole branch that died out and had to be pruned. So, you know, it was kind of a perfectly rounded shrub, but um, you know, that happens. It is technically a marginal plant in zone six. Dang guys, I want to get back in the water. That felt good. <laughs> um, this here, so this whole garden really has several different types of ferns. Basically the whole concept is just different ferns, liriope, and hostas. So right near this iron raptor, which a local artist makes, um, it, that, the hosta that you see, the variegated hosta, is a patriot. Uh, I'm just gonna kind of blow through these hostas quickly. This is hosta wide brim which is not a very vigorous hosta and it pretty much gets choked out by the, um, what's supposed to be annual vinca, but it's fully hardy in zone six, as is Wojo's gem. This gorgeous mass planting that you see here is hosta albo marginata. This is hosta loganensis, just kidding. Um, <laughs> so again, um, dad's been really into the coral bells. So dad is starting to kind of do plant stuff and you know, that sort of thing. Um, this is Hosta Hall's Glory. That's an arrowhead, which I will cover all the aquatic plants in this pond. But the golden variegated Hosta you see here is Paul's Glory. This bamboo that you see here is a Fargesia rufa, which is a clumping bamboo. And clumping bamboo is another plant that's awesome for dry shade. They're perfect for if you wanted privacy in a shady area. Everyone always tries to plant arborvitaes and junipers for shade, uh, excuse me, for privacy hedges. They just don't work in the shade. As you can see, the laurel is a great evergreen option. The bamboo is evergreen down to about negative uh, five or 10 or something. 
which by the way guys the negative temperatures that different broadleaf evergreen plants can tolerate is going to vary based on climate so like if your temperature is going to drop an extreme amount very quickly you know the plant isn't going to necessarily go and tolerate negative five you know here in buffalo the advantage is that the lake lake erie and ontario is we're kind of sandwiched between those two great lakes so we don't get temperature swings really it, it, that happen quickly we don't get a lot of the extreme weather because the lakes buffer a lot of that which is great we do get a lot of snow in the winter that's kind of the main um and the winter does last a long time but that's kind of the main um thing as far as more plants go these sensitive ferns actually volunteered themselves in this patch of liriope spicata so with lily turf there's two different types there's this which is the spicata which is the spreading liriope and then there's also the clumping forms and you can see that th those are a darker shade of green they're frequently mislabeled in the nursery trade um, so just because you've had liriope potentially in a past garden doesn't mean that it's going to be aggressive the spicata i actually planted liriope spicata on purpose here because on one side it's stopped by the patio the pond will stop it on basically kind of one and a half sides and then here this is a pathway so even though it's kind of encroaching and dad did this this is a whole story <laughs> which i'm not going into um and so um basically the um it's fully enclosed and so yeah um, this fern here, which you can see looks similar to the ostrich fern, but it's a clumping fern. This is Dryopteris marginalis, which is one fern that once established will tolerate dry shade. Um, perhaps not as well as a Christmas fern, but still a gorgeous plant. <coughs> and then probably the fern that everyone was looking at while I was beating around the bush so to speak beating around the fern are is uh this cluster of three plants here these are perfectly hardy and evergreen in zone six and colder i believe um these are heart's tongue ferns and i don't know why they're not common in the trade probably because they grow so dang slowly but it is such a cool plant this one is the oldest i've had it in my garden in different areas transplanted around since I think 2015 or 16. And then these two were planted. Logan wants to say hi. Look at his Albright Knox, excuse me. Um, look at his Fra Frank Lloyd Wright collar with the art glass. I love that collar. Um, and so these two were planted significantly later to kind of capture this corner. Um, and they're also kind of made to look more natural with this boulder here. This is a ground cover called Sweet Woodruff, which is hard to see, but it is all in the Liriope spicata underneath. So if the Liriope gets cut back, that'll the, the Sweet Woodruff will flower. But what's funny is, is <laughs> Sweet Woodruff is a pretty aggressive ground cover because it traveled all the way from over here and kind of just probably a dormant rhizome, not a dormant rhizome, but a rhizome that you couldn't see and now it's popped up here, and then next spring it'll take this whole area. Got a pot with some lily of the valley and a begonia. Interesting combo. Good job, Dad. <laughs> right here, this is a very young sable miner. Um, this was purchased from a guy, actually from Buffalo, who moved down to South Carolina. Um, and yeah, it's very young. And Sable Miner is very slow growing. Um, right here I had what, another one of those clumping bamboos. And so basically the clumping bamboo was gorgeous and it made a very private patio area, but it got too big and it blocked the view of the pond from inside. So I dug it out, divided it, and planted it back in the jungle back there. But without further ado, I'm gonna cover briefly the aquatic plants in this pond. 
Um, I have, I planted three different types of lilies, but um, the white flowering lily and the yellow flowering lily are the most aggressive. Um, the white one is um, Nymphaea odorata, which is a native species to um, the eastern states. Um, there's also a yellow flowering one, which I believe is... Uh, there's a whole bunch of yellow flowering hardy water lilies. Um, I believe it's called Joey Tomasic. There's also one called Charlene Strawn, which it could be that one. I don't remember, but the yellow lily um, and the white lily have been planted in this pond for about four years now, three, four years since 2019. They've filled in gorgeous and they've been pretty much flowering, you know, rapid fire, you could say, which like, again, context, this giant ash tree, this giant gorgeous ash tree, which was planted 20 some years ago, um, the year I was born, actually, every child that's born should have a tree planted with it. So by the time they're young, they can have a tree to climb. Just my opinion. Um, and then think of the carbon capture. I digress. So lilies. So they're flowering really well for being in that much shade. Um, again, there's a bud ready to go, but they've been, you can see the, the coiled stems here. That's a spent flower. And these stems here that haven't bloomed yet are always straight. So like when you're deadheading, you can always tell, and there's a bud right there too. Um, that's how when you're deadheading these lilies, um, you know the curly stems you can always remove. Um, these dying leaves you'd want to remove too. That doesn't generally start happening until later in the summer. So lilies are great to shade the pond. They don't do a ton as far as nutrient capture that's really where your marginal plants are going to come in. Um, and in this pond, I do have a Monstera deliciosa cutting, which is super disappointing actually how little it's done. Um, here you can see an Acorus gramineus, which this variety is called Ogon. And so it's planted directly in the water. Algae, slip algae slippery. And after a few years, when you buy them at the nursery, it's always like if you got foliage that's that thick, you'd be doing well. But after they've been planted for a few years and they're happy, um, they will generally put out, um, they, bleh. <laughs> generally they will produce a much bigger, um, thicker leaf, which is pretty cool. Gorgeous plant and evergreen in zone six and perhaps in zone five as well. This is an iris, um, which I think was a volunteer because I don't remember planting it and neither does my dad. I've had iris versicolor in this pond for quite a while. You know, seeds will float around and the, skip, it, the cross flow and the lilies could have pushed the where the former clump was over here in the shade and the seed could have floated easily and kind of landed in this nook. I could absolutely see that happening midsummer based on the cross flow and how the pond functions. Pastas actually will grow as marginal aquatics, but they these are all planted on land, um, just beautifully cascading and softening this edge, um, which I actually don't like the stonework here at all. The next aquatic plant that you see here, this is a Peltandra virginica, otherwise known as Aero arum. And this plant is a native, believe it or not, as tropical as that might look, kind of like a um, Xanthosoma almost, a dwarf Xanthosoma. This is a hardy, shade tolerant, just gorgeous plant. Um, I haven't tried growing them in soil. I do think you'd need a water feature of some kind, but hey, that's a good thing. There's also a calla lily which comes back every year. I don't remember what cultivar it was, but I planted that years ago. And um, just as in, it's just in too much shade to blossom, but it's pretty, it's a nice little accent. I would imagine it's perennial because it's about less than a foot away from water. And again, just like the Great Lakes on a micro scale, 
this water feature is absolutely a microclimate. And then one of the more dramatic plants in the pond is Thalia dilbata, otherwise known as hardy water canna. These are hardy, probably in the zone five or six. Uh, um, they're probably planted in a little bit more water depth than um, you'd be used to seeing them, but clearly they're happy. Um, they will stretch and have bigger foliage and shade like this, um, but they'll flower in sun. They have a gorgeous purple exotic flower, which when I do a tour of my garden, I'll show you the Thalia flowering. It's absolutely stunning. So I have three plants here, which they don't really spread in zone six, or at least in the shade, they don't spread. Um, they were, <laughs> They've been planted for quite a while. Anyways, guys, this water plant here, I'm continuing to talk about the Thalia. Um, the one that has spread out a little bit more is in shallower water. So I do wonder if having them in shallower water and or more sun would make them spread more. But again, the shade, it's like you can't beat these big tropical heliconia-like leaves. I also want to mention too, guys, I've never, drained down this pond and pressure washed anything. This pond has just had good maintenance for three or four years. And again, looking at the gravel, this is something everyone always talks about. There's the liner. It's pristine. I mean, absolutely pristine. And I'm not just cherry picking an area that would be good. And even the gravel after four years of an established, beautiful pond that's healthy, the gravel even is getting its color back. You know, it's not all coated in algae. So there are no chemicals. There is nothing harmful. I shouldn't drink the water, but it's clean enough. It's life-sustaining water, which again is just, you know, and yeah, you know, there are some floating particulates, but that's also because I stirred stuff up. But that's one of the main jobs of the koi who are stressed that I'm in the water. Um, the koi are fantastic at rooting around in gravel. That's what they love to do. That's actually why they have those little whiskers, which are called barbells, not the weights. But koi have the whiskers so that they can actually root around in the gravel, as you can see the big gold guy doing there a little bit. I wanna to touch on waterfalls too. There is actually, waterfalls release what's called negative ions, and you'd have to get more details from Ed the Pond Professor, but negative ions you breathe those in and it has a physiological response it's almost like earthing to where our the you know when you ground your feet your bare feet on soil healthy soil um it releases all that it balances you out chemically and you can see i'm not really well versed in the science of earthing but again that's real science that waterfalls and earthing are um, really good for reducing stress quite significantly and you know i'm earthing on top of gravel and i have a waterfall nearby dude that's a double whammy <laughs> and so i know we're talking about the pond today but i just want to show the rest of the environment and the garden i will probably do a full garden tour here of, of dad's garden i think you can officially call it dad's garden um, these bananas are so amazing. They were planted back in 2014 out from a four inch container. The plant was probably about, you know, smaller than that, probably about that tall. And uh, in just nine years, this clump of Musa Bostu has spread into, probably spread about three and a half feet or so. And um, yeah, you can see some of the stems have died and the pups have taken the place of that. Uh, Musa Bostu does make a fantastic aquatic plant. So the flowers of Musa Bostu in Western New York don't really come out of the top ever, um, but I have had stems that have died off such as that one and many others in the past. And those stems, I do believe had flowers in them, which is why they died, because banana stems can live for quite a long time. But, you know, this uh, light, there are three different lights that kind of twinkle 
up in the canopy of this hardy banana plant at night just to make it absolutely magical. And then this clump over here uh, has a hardy colocasia in it. This is Colocasia gaulagongensis. And um, I, again, I know it's not pond related necessarily, but it's in the vicinity of the pond. So I'm gonna show you guys. Um, so yeah, that's Colocasia, Colocasia gaulagongensis, which is probably reliably 6B hardy. Um, I always mulch this whole clump of bananas. It's pretty far away from the house. So it's just a good practice. So this elephant ear is a running type elephant ear. You can see the snake-like runners right here. That will produce a new plant, actually technically all along the stem if you uh, buried it in mulch, but um, I haven't. And this plant actually has mosaic virus. You can almost see it, but for whatever reason, this plant is able to fight the mosaic virus off and or it's in a healthy enough soil and environment to where it can fight the virus, which is absolutely fascinating. Like, I don't know a thing about how that happens because it's killed all of my other elephant ears that were planted in the ground and perennial in this garden. But for whatever reason, Galagongensis is seems to be tolerating its existence with virus. And again, I would love to send that off to tissue culture and get it cleaned and have clean Galagongensis, but um, that's actually why this plant isn't at my garden at my house, because it has virus. Drop a comment down below if you think I should take the risk and potentially move a virus plant into my new garden. I don't know, I'm so on the fence. We're gonna cover dad's raised beds that he did another day. Um, he did a fantastic job with those. But yeah, guys, that's kind of the pond area right off the patio. Um, I think pretty much all the plants I've covered. Uh, and I went into a little bit of detail with the pond itself. All right, yeah, I love these plants. I hope you enjoyed the video. Leave a comment down below. What did you learn? I'm curious to hear. Do you have a pond? Have you always wanted a pond? or some sort of water feature. I'm always curious too, what kind of misconceptions are out there around maintenance and or poorly designed water features? Because poorly designed water features can absolutely be a horrific experience. Believe me, it's how I ended up with Aquascape. Anyways guys, anyways guys, if you wanna see more content just like this, be sure to gently tap that subscribe button and uh, Hit the bell if you want to have all the notifications or personalized or, you know, all that YouTube jazz. And um, if you like the con, if you like this video, be sure to drop it a big ol' thumbs up, just like that. And then again, let's chat in the comments. I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys. All right, y'all. Thanks for watching. See you next week.